Scott Bond in Germany. Since 2016, uh, he is postdoc in Judy Allen's laboratory at the University of Manchester. Uh, he loves travel and photography, and he has visited uh, 45 countries so far, and uh, he hopes to get more places when the pandemic ends. Uh, today, today uh, he is going to tell us about his work entitled al 178 both initiates via interferon gamma suppression and limits the pulmonary type 2 immune response to nematode infection. Uh, important, if anyone has questions, please write them in the chat and they will be read at the end of the presentation. Uh, with no more for the moment, uh, we welcome Dr. Agenda. Uh, yeah, thank you very much uh, for the introduction and also obviously thank you very much for the invitation to present my work on this uh, great platform. Um, it's definitely an honor to do this. So um, the paper, like you said on the title, um, we actually submitted last year, uh, towards the end of last year and it got uh, uh, accepted and published um, this summer during lockdown actually so it was some positive news while we were all in lockdown here so um, yeah before I get to the data I just want to uh, introduce you to my lab so this is the lab of, of uh, Judy Allen this is us after a nice meal at our favorite restaurant and um, yeah I think all of us are aware of Professor Judy Allen who is well known for her work in macrophage biology type 2 immunity helmet immunology studies and uh, yeah this group consists of several postdocs and uh, lab assistants technicians and all of them contributed in one way or another to this work so obviously this is not possible without this teamwork here and also one person i would like to mention is dr tara sutherland who is an associated fellow who also um, contributed and drove this work to publication um, so as we realized, we all will actually talk about the same helmet model, which is Nippur Strongylus brasiliensis. So I think we will uh, repeat this life cycle a few times, but I just go through it very quickly. So um, we infect our mice with the L infectious L3 larvae stage, and it's known that this uh, larvae migrates into the lung. It bursts through the capillaries and causes a lot of damage there, that's, as we can see here in the histology pictures. And um, after causing all this damage in the lung, the worms get coughed up and swallowed into the small intestine and then gets expelled by the rat or by the mouse in this case. And Nipostrongyl is widely used because it is such a strong type 2 immune response inducer. So it's a great model to study type 2 immune responses and it's therefore also like used in a lot of different uh, labs all over the world. So the actual immune response in the lung, I kind of want to introduce you to that using a little uh, uh, cartoon here. So at the late stage of this infection, so in our hands is around day five, six, seven, we have the strong type two immune response with all these features which are known to be type two. So we see eosinophilia, we see ILC2, and we see this adaptive CD4 T cell response producing all these type two cytokines like interleukin four, five, and 13. So we have this type two phase, but if you look early in infection, and this is something which several labs have shown, and also our lab in particular, we see this expansion of gamma delta T cells, and these produce high amounts of IL-17A. And this IL-17A also drives neutrophils. So we see early on in this infection, so day one to day two, a more pro-inflammatory picture. And the question which I tried to answer in our project was, how important is this early IL-17A neutrophilia for the development of this later type two response? So are these two independent phases or are they connected to each other? So when we started to work on this, um, we started using IL-17 knockout mice, so mice deficient for this important cytokine of this early immune response. And then we infect these mice with 250 larvae, and then we look into our, um, yeah, the phenotype we get there. And what we see, first of all, is that these mice are more susceptible to the infection. So we see significantly increased parasite burden here on day four and day six in the gut. And when we look into the immune response, we see here in the bile fluid significantly less neutrophils early on in the infection. And at the later stage, we also see significantly less or less eosinophils here in this. Uh, this is the bile fluid, but the same goes also for the lung. What was even more striking is that the adaptive type 2 response was also impaired. So we see in the IL 17A knockout mice significantly less CD4 T cells, and also these T cells produce less ty type 2 cytokines like IL 4 or IL 13, as shown here. 
in absolute numbers, but also in frequencies. So it kind of shows that these mice lacking IL-17A are not able to mount this full type two immune response in the lung. We took a more detailed approach here again, and we kind of looked into the phenotype of these CD4 T cells. And also there we see an impairment. So these T cells are less active as shown here by CD69 expression and also different markers which are shown or associated with the type two setting like EGFR, ST2 and PD1 are all lower expressed in the T cells of il 17 knockout mice. So it kind of shows this impairment of the type two response and also that il 17 a regulates T cell activation and phenotype here in our uh, Nipostrongulus model. So the next question obviously was, why is this happening? What's, what's the mechanism behind it? And as I showed you before, the il 17 a is important in driving the neutrophilia. So the first step we did was focusing on the neutrophils. And um, the question we basically asked is, are neutrophils required for this subsequent type two response? And uh, before I show this data, I have to mention that this part of the project is in the bioarchive version of our publication. And in the actual paper, we actually took it out again because we're currently working on a more detailed picture of the neutrophil. So if you're interested in this part, you have to look into the bioarchive version of the publication. Um, so what we did here, we took uh, black six wild type mice and depleted neutrophils using anti li 6 g and then again looked in at the different time points. And to keep this short, what we see mainly was, first of all, <clears throat> the neutrophils are contributing massively to the damage in the lung during nipo infection. So as you can see, we have your naive lung, and this is a lung with uh, infection with nipo and also with the neutrophils in there. And you can see this massive damage which is caused in the lung combined with hemorrhages and blood bleeding, bleeding uh, wounds. But when you get rid of the neutrophils, you don't see the same severe injury. So you see damage caused by the helminths, but it's not as severe as in the isotype treated group. So the neutrophils seem to be a major driver of the injury here. However, when we looked into the immune response, we did not see much of a change in the type two setting. Where we see changes are the eosinophil numbers as shown here in the lung and in the bowel fluid. So if you deplete neutrophils early on, you get at the later stage a down-regulated eosinophilia as shown here in these two graphs. And this kind of indicated to us that there is a connection between the neutrophils and the eosinophils. And this is something we are currently working on to try to figure out how are these two setups connected. It could be driven by chemokines. And one of the candidate chemokines we came up with is CCL8, because this kind of also mirrors what we see in the eosinophil numbers, so also down-regulated after the depletion. So this is something we are currently working at. But um, to kind of sum up this part, so we see the neutrophils are massively induced early in the infection, and they seem to be a major driver of the injury together with the nipostrongulus, but it does not connect to the adaptive type two immune response, so there must be another way. However, the eosinophilia seems to be connected with the neutrophilia, and this could be by CCL8, but we don't rule out any other factors here in this, um, in this mechanism. So, we got the role of the neutrophils, but we still weren't sure about how is the type two response connected to the early phase and what's the role of il 17 a in driving this type two response. But we were kind of pretty sure that something early in infection is um, causing the mechanism for the later stage type two response. So what we did next was like kind of an unbiased approach. So we did a transcriptomic analysis. So we took some lung samples from the early infection and uh, compared infected wild-type mice and infected il 17 knockout mice. And as you can see in this heat map, there are several different genes up or down regulated depending on the strain. And uh, what we could have done is obviously going through all these genes and looking for their functions. But we decided to run all these significantly differently expressed genes in a pathway analyzer. And what we thought was really interesting is that interferon gamma showed up as an major upstream regulator in these il 17 knockout mice. So meaning that when il 17 a is absent, interferon gamma is much more active in these mice. So this was very interesting and it also fit very well with what we have seen in our flow data. Um, as you can see here in these uh, three graphs, mice which got infected, so wild type mice, show a down regulation of interferon gamma by all different cell types, so gamma delta T cells, CD4 T cells, and CD8 T cells. However, when you look at these 
parameters in an IL-17 knockout mice, you see that this downregulation is not happening. And the same also goes for mRNA levels here, as shown here for the relative expression of interferon gamma. And this kind of indicates that IL-17 suppresses interferon gamma early post-infection. And um, this is shown for day two, but we also look a bit earlier. This is 16 hours post-infection, so the time point when uh, NIPO actually reaches the lung. And we also see here the same down-regulation of interferon gamma in the wild-type mice, but it's significantly increased in IL-17 and knockout mice. And uh, this is shown for gamma delta T cells, and we could also pinpoint this to the CD27 positive subset of gamma delta T cells being the major producer of IL-17A. And this data together kind of led us to the question, does interleukin-17A suppress interferon gamma and thereby supporting type 2 responses? So kind of putting, putting together all three arms of the immune response in one setting. So to answer this question now, what we did next was blocking interferon gamma. So we took our mice, we depleted interferon gamma early during the infection, so the time point when this peak is actually happening. And then we looked again into our type 2 immune response. And as you can see here now, we see that the ISMDA knockout mice depleted by interferon gamma showed an increase in these type 2 features like eosinophilia here and here the CD4 T cell numbers. And the same also goes for uh, type 2 producing cytokines by the T cells like interleukin 5 and interleukin 13. And what's important to note here is also that wild type mice, which were depleted by interferon gamma, did not show any of these increased uh, uh, production of these cytokines or of the cell types, because here we have is a already suppressing interferon gamma, so the blocking of interferon gamma does not lead to a further increase of the type 2 immune response. Um, so basically, we can say with these experiments that interferon gamma neutralization in is a knockout mice rescues this impaired type 2 immune response. Also, what we did was looking again at the T cells and at these markers I uh, previously mentioned. And again, also these cells and these markers are upregulated upon uh, blocking of interferon gamma. So this is CD69. So these T cells are more active again. And also markers like ST2, PD1, and EGFR are more upregulated upon the depletion of interferon gamma. So again, we kind of rescue this impaired phenotype by neutralization of interferon gamma. So there were several of the parameters in our experiments, however, which not only were rescued, but as you can see in this graph for IL-4 and KILL-3, so YM-1, which actually exceeded the values we see in our wild-type mice by a lot. So they kind of overshoot the wild-type response. And this kind of let us believe that there must be a second role for il 17 a which only gets revealed here when you get rid of interferon gamma and have an il 17 a knockout mice which is that the late stage IL-17A maybe has a suppressing function on the type 2 immune response. So early on, it's promoting the type 2 response, but maybe at the later stage, it might put like a cap on the response, so it suppresses this again, because we all know that a type 2 response, which uh, is not checked, can get excessive and lead also to pathology. So maybe 17A has a controlling function at this stage. And to um, test this hypothesis, we um, used another blocking experiment, and this time we blocked in IL-17A. Um, we blocked this in the middle phase of infection, so the early IL-17A is still developing. It still suppresses the interferon gamma and let the type 2 response develop, but then this late stage IL-17A should then show us if it has an effect on suppressing the type 2 response. And uh, our data here, so this is for T cells, we see again when you block interleukin, when you block interleukin uh, 17A, you get an increase in T cell responses. So this is IL-5 and this is IL-13, but much more of an effect we see in the ILC2 numbers. So we have a higher frequency of ILC2. We have more in absolute numbers of ILC2 in the lung, and also they produce more type 2 cytokines. So kind of showing that interleukin 17 has the second function at the later stage of the infection where it suppresses this already developed type 2 response. So coming back to my uh, scheme here, so the data together shows that interleukin 17A is important in blocking or suppressing interferon gamma early on, and this goes for all the inter interferon gamma producing uh, cell types. And by blocking this interferon gamma response, it kind of allows the type 2 response to develop. So it kind of promotes this by shutting down this TH1 or type 1 response. 
And at the later stage of the infection, interleukin 17A, this time mainly produced by TH17 cells, is needed to then suppress this um, type 2 response or keep this type 2 response in check from becoming uh, excessive and leading to pathology. So the next question we have was um, if this observed IL-17A dependent phenotype, is it lung specific and is it nipple specific? So do we see this in other tissues, other organs? And also can we observe this in another setting, in another mouse model, for example? So um, obviously we know nipple migrates through the lung and then into the gut and gets expelled there. So we have had a look in different tissues. So this is spleen, um, interleukin-4 and IL-13. This is in the gut, IL-4 in relative expression. And also this is CD4 T cells and lung draining lymph nodes. But as you can see in all these other tissues, we don't see any difference here. So we don't see an impairment of the type 2 response. So kind of showing us that this IL-17A dependent mechanism is really specific to the lung. But we wanted to test this further. And for this, we um, got together with the lab of uh, Professor Richard Grancis. And we used a high-dose trichuris murus infection. So this is a more of an acute infection. And this nematode is strictly gastrointestinal. So it does not have a lung stage. And as you can see in this uh, graph already, there was no changes in worm burden, for example, here in the cecum. And when you look into the immune response in the cecum here for eosinophils, neutrophils, and also in the mesenteric lymph nodes, so CD4 T cells and IL-5 producing CD4 T cells, there was not really an impairment observed in these mice. So showing that IL-17A is not needed to induce this protective immune response at the site of infection with trichuris murus. However, in these experiments, we uh, still took the lung because uh, it is kind of known that there is also an immune response ongoing in the lung, even though these, these helminths don't get into the lung itself. And what was interesting is that these IL-17 knockout mice, even in this setting, show an impaired neutrophil neutrophilia response and also the type 2 response, which is ongoing at the same stage, is also downregulated here by shown here the IL-5 positive CD4 T cells and also IL-4 here in relative expression. So the type 2 response is still downregulated here, even in a helminth infection model where there is actually no real lung stage. And fitting with the story in the nipple strongness model, we also see an increase of interferon gamma. Again, IL-17A knockout mice have increased interferon gamma, so there is no suppression happening, which is presumably happening in these wild type. So showing further that this is really a lung-specific uh, phenomenon we observe here. So yeah, to come to a conclusion here with this story, so this is basically a dual role for is and and all depends on the right place and on the right time. So early on in an infection, you have this is and response by gamma delta T cells, and this is and like I showed, is suppressing interferon gamma early on and thereby supporting this type two immune response and at the later stage, we need IL-17A again to suppress the type 2 response and to kind of keep this all in check. And um, yeah, this is basically the finding we have from this. So it's kind of a fundamental new discovery that IL-17A can have this dual role in this lung-specific setting. So with this, um, yeah, I would like to thank you guys for inviting me and for uh, the attention. Obviously, a lot of thanks to the funders and the university and obviously also Professor Judy Allen. And uh, yeah, thank you guys for your attention and I'm open for any questions. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Ajendra, uh, for uh, this presentation that had an amazing work. Uh, we had uh, some questions in the chat. Uh, Paula Licona Limon says, a uh, very nice talk, thanks. Uh, did you check if basophils were also affected in the IL-17-8 knockout mice? Uh, no, I did not look at basophils. Uh, I'm not sure if Juan likes this answer, but um, I did look into basophils here. I, I don't, I can't, I mean, we know that IL-4 is downregulated in these IL-17 knockout mice. We know basophils are a major source for IL-4. So there might be an impairment there, but we haven't looked into basophils. So that might be something to look at uh, if is a actually contributes or regulates this um, cell type as well here. Okay, uh, uh, Paula Licon uh, says, uh, <laughs> did you sell any changes in other innate interferon gamma producers such as CLC1s? So we looked into NK cells as an innate source. And I mean, I didn't show it 
in my uh, slide here, but NKCS also showed this down regulation of uh, interferon gamma. So I, I think this is really a global effect of this ism DNA in all these lung populations which produce interferon gamma. And I think you really need to suppress interferon gamma throughout the whole uh, timing, time point that in this infection to really regulate this and then get the type two response started. Okay, and uh, we had some more questions. Uh, Alexandra Ehrens, uh, uh, I agree this is a really nice talk, thank you. I would like to know if the baseline levels of interferon gamma in IL-17 a naive knockout mice is also increased. That's a very good question. Um, so the naive levels are pretty much on this pretty similar. So you start off with the same amount of uh, interferon gamma in these mice. And then when you have the infection in the wild type, it decreases, so it gets suppressed. But in the, in the ISMD knockout mice, it stays the same or it even increases a little bit more. So that's, uh, they start off at the same baseline level here, yes. But that's a really good question, yeah. Okay, and uh, we have another question. Uh, Paula Licona, mechanistically, how, how did you explain the apparent opposite effect of IL-17 in early versus late infection time points? Yeah, that's a good question. And that's something we uh, will probably try to work on next, like to see maybe what's really the mo molecular basis of these uh, suppression mechanism at these different time points, why the early innate source is promoting it and why at the latest time point it's suppressing this. I can't really answer this right now. Um, it might be the environment when this ism DNA gets released and how it's then acting on the different cell types. Maybe it's ism DNA receptor expression on different cell types which leads to these different functions. But this is something we have to work out then next, like really going deeper into the mecha actual mechanisms here. Okay. Uh, uh, Juan Clanrico uh, says, uh, great talk. Uh, do, does the fat chart by blocking the late IL-17 suggest that there is a constant, albeit small, suppression of IL-17 even in the later stage of nipostronchial resilience infection? Uh, sorry, I didn't get the question, sorry. Okay. Uh, does the effect observed by blocking the late IL-17 suggest that there is a constant, albeit a small secretion of IL-17, even in the later stage of NIPO infection? Um, so I think you, I, I think the uh, voice just got disconnected there. But I mean, if I understand the question right, so the suppression, suppressive effect might be just there as long as interferon gamma is down-regulated in the type 2 response is involving and then late, at later stage um, it probably depends also on the source of il 17 a again what's happening there okay can I, can I just clarify there sorry no, so, no. My yeah so I guess I guess what I'm asking is the fact that you see an effect on the late stages that suggests that there is production of 17 if not oh, you yeah of right. course, yeah. I guess the question, because I didn't make it correct, is have you actually characterized the IL-17 secretion, secretion, you know, the kinetic response of it? Yeah, I mean, it is massively increased early on. So after two days of infection or the early on, you have this really big spike and then it gets less, obviously. Um, as soon as then the type 2 response started, you get a TH17 response also later on in the lung. And this is probably what, this is what we think is down-regulating then the later stage type two response. So it's not really the gamma deltas then, because also the numbers of the gamma delta T cells goes down with infection. So it has to be CD4 T cells, which are doing this mainly. And there is a lot of um, TH17 cells around at that time, yes. Okay, and uh, uh, thank you very much. Uh, we, uh, finally, we have uh, time for one more question. Uh, really, uh, Tiffany Bocchery says, uh, really great story. Any ideas as to why this is a long specific phenomenon? Um, so there is work from uh, David Artis lab, which actually showed that in the gut, you also need to suppress interferon gamma for a type two response to develop. But in that st study, it's TSLP, which is actually down regulating interferon gamma and not is a So I think this um, this idea of down-regulating interferon gamma is 
actually something you have to have in these settings. So you have to downregulate gamma so that your type two response can evolve. And it just seems like that depending on the tissue, you have a different molecule taking over this job. So in the lung, it seems to be IL-17A as we show in our study, but then there is this other study which shows that TSLP is like a suppressor of interferon gamma at the, late, at the gut stage. So it might be really that you have to find this right molecule which is down-regulating um, interferon gamma at, in the different tissues, yeah. Uh, okay, I, I think we have another question. Uh, Ophelia Munoz uh, asks, uh, could you try to deplete gamma delta T salt and assert the influence of the, their sources on interferon, of interferon gamma? Yeah, um, so we, this idea came up a few times to deplete gamma delta T cells or use gamma delta knockout mice, but we never really thought this would give us a new insight or more of an answer to other questions we had. So we just globally blocked interferon gamma and not really specifically blocked the gamma delta T cell interferon gamma. Um, we have these mice here now, the gamma delta knockouts. I'm not sure if we will do uh, lipoic infections with these. Might be interesting to see how they react because you also block a source of 17A in that case and not only uh, interferon gamma, unless you block really the subset of gamma delta T cells. Um, it is something we thought about, but we decided not to go that route. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, th thank you very much, uh, Dr. Ajendra. Uh, with this, uh, we finish our first presentation. Uh, thank you very much again. Uh, and I'm going to give the floor to uh, Ophelia to present the, our, our, our next speaker. Hi, hi everyone. Now it's time to, to listen to our second speaker. And she is Tiffany, the Dr. Tiffany Bouchery. Uh, she has done her PhD with Dr. Coralie Martin and Professor O'Dill in Paris in 2011. And during her 